Hey, I'm John. Thanks for tuning in to Faith Community Online. If you haven't already, take a moment and click the red subscribe button so you're the first to know the next time we post a video or podcast that will help you connect, grow, and lead right where you're at. And if you'd like to know more about getting connected at Faith Community, stick around at the end for all the ways you can do that. We hope you are encouraged to take your next step as you move from where you are to where God wants you to be. Last week, we started a little mini series that we called Foggy Faith. And uh, we talked about how everyone at some point or another finds themselves in a situation, a circumstance, a struggle, a problem, or just a season of life where things don't make sense. Has anyone, I'm just gonna take a poll. I didn't ask this last week. How many of you have been in one of those seasons at least once? Raise your hand, hold it up. The rest of you are liars, liars, liars. Yeah, we've all been there. Don's got two hands up. Uh, we, we've, we've all been in those scenarios and circumstances. And uh, if I could give you a definition, it's this. It's when what you see in front of you doesn't match what you believe. It's when the circumstance that you're living in simply doesn't match this faith and this God that you read about in scripture. And you're like, I believe that God's my provider, but right now my bank says I don't have any money, right? I believe that God's my healer, but the doctor says the cancer's back. I believe that God loves me, but I've never felt more alone and unloved than I feel right now. Life doesn't make sense. Everything seems murky. Everything seems cloudy. And no matter what I do, no matter what action I take, I just feel like I'm stuck in this place. I don't know what to do. That's foggy faith. And we, we looked at the story of the, the father in Mark chapter nine, who had a son who was demonized and he was in that space and, and he came to Jesus and simply wanted his son to be set free, which is what every one of us would want. And he got to that heart-riching moment where he had to be honest with Jesus. And he said this in verse 24. He said, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe never have more honest words been spoken in scripture than right there, right? Because what he just said is the tension every one of us manage every day. It's the tension between what we believe about God, that he is good, that he is just, that we can trust him, we can lean into him, but also all these problems that don't make sense and why doesn't he wave his magic wand and make it all better? We manage this tension from day to day and it's in that space, right? When life doesn't make sense, when you feel like you're not hearing answers from God, it's in that space that some people who follow Jesus get off course. They abandon faith. They say, you know what? I've had enough church. I've had enough services. I've had enough Bible reading. I'm just done. Probably more, um, <clears throat> more tragic are those, and this may be more of us in the room today, are those who settle for a version of faith that the Bible doesn't even talk about. It's a powerless faith. It's a faith that just has us show up on Sundays and stand while the songs are sung. And when the preaching happens, we just go, well, that's great for somebody, but that doesn't apply to me. It's that faith where we settle. Sometimes it's a faith where we begin to believe God is smaller than he actually is, or it's a hopeless faith. That's foggy faith. And what we encouraged you last week with is that your faith is real, because if you're going through that, you've more than likely found a spot where you've heard this voice. It's not the voice of God. It's the voice of your enemy who's telling you, you're a failure, you stink, you don't have good enough faith, you should probably just give up. But the reality is every person I know at some point or another has walked into that place where their faith doesn't make sense and it just is foggy and they can't figure it out. In fact, every Bible character we read about in the Bible, that's their story. That's who they are. That's what we see everywhere we look. But your faith is real. Look at somebody next to you and say, my faith is real. Tell them, my faith is real. I don't care how bad your week's been. I don't care how much you thought about giving up. I don't care what happened to you. I mean, I care, but hear me today. Your faith is real. Your faith is real. You have to anchor to the fact that a real faith in Jesus is not a perfect world faith because there is no perfect world, right? And then we also talked about how you're never alone. Again, we just all said to each other, we go through this, which means we're in this together. We should be bearing one another's burdens. We should be serving one another, helping each other. And not only are we not alone because we're all going through it, we're not alone because God's with us every day. He said, he promised, he promised Double dog, dare, fingers. I mean, just all the best promises you can come up with. He promised he would never leave or forsake us. And I don't know if you know this about God. He doesn't break his promises. He doesn't break his promises. And so he's with you. And that's what we looked at last week. And now we're gonna move forward just one step further. And this week I wanna talk about what it means to develop an instrument-rated faith. And I'm gonna explain that in just a minute because there's some depth to it. 
But what does it mean to develop an instrument-rated faith so that we can navigate the fog in a healthy way and not crash? How many of you kind of had in your heart on your way here today, I kind of like to not crash today. How many of that's kind of your goal every time you get in the car? How many of you ever had a crash and know it stinks? And it's not the crash, it's the insurance, right? It's dealing with insurance companies that stinks getting your car fixed. And so we want to not crash out in our faith. So take out or turn on your Bible. You have a copy somewhere. Take it out and turn to Psalms chapter 63. And we're going to pick up that story in just a minute. But first, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever flown on an airplane before? Raise your hand, raise it high. All right. Several of you, you can put it down. How many of you have never flown on an airplane before? Raise your hand. All right. All right. You guys love Missouri a lot. Like... Please tell me you've left the county. There's more to see. There's more to see. How many of you have ever died in a plane crash? Raise your hand. Raise your hand all across the room. I saw a hand back there. That's a story we, you should be preaching today, okay? Come on. That was a trick question. Um, the past few years, my role with Convoy of Hope, it requires that I travel quite a bit. And so from where I'm at, uh, it takes uh, two or three flights to get anywhere. And so I'm, every year I'm on about a hundred different planes, a hundred different flights going somewhere. And I've experienced some awkward, you know, not awkward, normal weather conditions, but how many of you know normal weather conditions standing on the ground is one thing. Uh, normal weather conditions in a plane are completely a different thing. And so I've flown into uh, Minneapolis and Green Bay when there's snow and ice and just horrible weather. I've flown into DFW where uh, in the summertime there can be thunderstorms and lightning cracking all around you anywhere you go. One of the most beautiful places I've flown into is, is it's really practical, but it's Chicago. If you fly into Chicago in the morning, you'll usually go out over the lake. And as you get low and are able to see, you'll see the fog rolling in off Lake Michigan into the city. And you'll see the tops of the buildings standing up above it. But while that's beautiful, how many of you know fog is beautiful from a distance? <laughs> right? It's beautiful from a distance. But when you're in it, it's a totally different thing. And so then you start, the plane comes around and it starts to settle into the fog. And now you're in the fog and you can't see anything. And if you're one of those people who keep the, the shade down on the airplane when you're landing, you're weird. Come on, put the shade up. You need to know if the ground is coming or not, right? And I'm coming down in this fog and I know the plane is getting ready to land. And I'm thinking to myself, I hope we're near an airport, <laughs> right? Because I can't see one. Somebody must know where we're going. And then as we break through the clouds or the fog, sometimes we're less than 100 yards off the ground. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there it is. And then we touch down on the ground. We've never crashed, never been in a plane crash. Do you know why? Do you know why the planes don't crash when those conditions and those weather circumstances are there? It's really one word, training, training, right? The, the pilots are trained. I recently sat down with a friend of mine who is a uh, commercial uh, private jet pilot and uh, just wanted to have a conversation with him about it. And he told me there are basically two types or categories of pilots. There are hobby pilots and commercial pilots. And there are differences between the two based on um, to determine what they can do and what they can't do and what they're able to deal with. So for example, a hobby pilot is someone who only flies when the skies are clear, when the skies are blue. They're not allowed to fly into a cloud. They're not allowed to fly into bad weather. They're just uh, visual flight rules or what they go by. The way they fly is by looking out the window and seeing. Now they have gauges, they're on the dash of the plane, but oftentimes you can tell if you're turning by looking out the window. You can see where the horizon is. That's a hobby pilot. And their limit is 12,000 feet. They can only fly up to 12,000 feet. Now, a commercial pilot achieves a different rating. They, they qualify for an instrument-rated certification. And what that means is they are trained for every possible condition they may come into, every possible situation they may go into. And don't get me wrong, they love good weather, Right? Every pilot loves good weather, but they're prepared for the worst. And because they're prepared, they can fly up to 60,000 feet, which also means they don't have to avoid weather. They can go as far as they need to go to get there. As I talked to my friend, he told me about a story he read, an article he read that said, on average, it only takes 60 seconds in a cloud for a hobby pilot to become disoriented and or crash. 60 seconds of not being able to see sets them on a course where now they no longer know where they are. They no longer know what their heading is. And all of a sudden, they begin to find themselves in a horrible situation. 
And so the simplest definition of an instrument rated certification is this. It's the ability to fly when you can't see anything or when you can't trust your feelings. The ability to fly when you can't see anything or you can't trust your feelings. He told me that kind of the weirdest time to fly is at night because it's dark and the horizon and the, the, the sky merge together and the lights on the ground and the stars in the sky all blend together and you just don't quite know where you are. And he says, the only thing you can trust in that moment are the gauges that tell you what is real. The only thing you can trust is to look down on that dash and see those gauges because they will tell you the facts. And he was emphatic about this. He said, in that moment, in the dark, in the fog, you cannot trust what you see and you cannot trust what you feel because you have to trust the gauges. And as he talked about that, he's a Christian. The guy I was talking to is a believer and I, I couldn't help but allow my, my mind to race toward the spiritual parallels of that the spiritual parallels of that theory. And this is the question that came up in my soul as I, I talked to him and pondered over this a little bit. I began to ask, how many of us simply function as hobby Christians? How many of us, when we talk about our faith, what we really have is a hobby faith? It's a faith that um, only works on good days. It's a Christianity that only works when everything's going right. It's a Christianity that only functions when there's no problems around. And the quickest sign as to whether or not we're full-on professional Christians, have professional faith versus hobby Christians and hobby faith is, how many seconds does it take you to crash when you come into a cloudy situation in life that you weren't expecting? How long does it take for your faith all of a sudden? You could have been singing songs of praise, you could have been happy about life, but then this happens and all of a sudden you're in the tank. How long does it take? And other questions begin to roll into my mind, like as followers of Jesus, why do we assume the skies will always be blue? <laughs> why do we assume that there'll never be bad weather or circumstances or situations or conditions? Why are we surprised when life flips upside down, when Jesus flat out said, in this life, in this world, you'll have troubles and trials and struggles of many kinds. Amen. Like he didn't hide it. He said, this is going to happen. But I always try to come back to the question that's most important. And this is the question that came back to me. I think it might be the best question. Why are we so unprepared? Because if we want to survive the conditions that come at us, we need to train for the conditions that come at us and be prepared to deal with them. And so here's the big idea I want us to embrace today. And it's this, navigating the fog requires an instrument rated faith. An instrument rated faith. It means my faith can navigate in conditions when I can't see and I can't trust my feelings. My faith will keep going. And there are several gauges. You say, what does that mean? It's, it's a set, we need a set of trusted spiritual gauges that warn us and correct us when we can't see anything and when we're off course. I wanna say that again. We need to develop a trusted set of spiritual gauges that we can look at in our lives that will tell us when we're off track and that will warn us when we're about to crash. That's what it means to have an instrument rated faith. Now, there are several areas that we need to actively gauge. How do you know a gauge is simply something uh, that indicates or measures a change versus a factual standard? What that means is this, the gauge on your car when you came in today, the speedometer, right? Whatever yours goes to, let's just imagine zero to 100. Um, 100 miles per hour means in one hour's driving time, you'll go how far? 100 miles. It's, it's a set factual standard. If you don't move at all, you're at zero for an hour. How far will you have gone? Zero. And the needle is not setting the speed for you. The needle's not telling you how fast you should or shouldn't go. The needle is simply gauging what you are doing and what's happening around you as you drive down the road. And the same thing is we need to watch in our spirit as well as we need to understand there are gauges God has given us to gauge what's happening in our soul and in our spirit. He's given us gauges to see if we're about to crash or if we're on course. 
So whether you operate a plane, a car, a boat, a motorcycle, I think most of us get the idea of a gauge. Well, there's some gauges you'll see here on the screen. These are flight gauges. And uh, I just kind of give you an example of some of these. So bottom left is a gauge that's called the turn indicator. So imagine turning the steering wheel on your car. Most of us have done that before. In an airplane, it tells you if the plane is banking right or left. Uh, Now, in an airplane, if it banks right at the same bank, same degree for a long time, how do you know what happens? It goes in circles. So when we think about going in circles and the gauge we need to find spiritually, it's gauging the lies that we believe about God, ourselves, and others. Because if you believe a lie, it will skew the way you live your life. And you'll just keep going in circles in the fog. You'll keep turning and turning. You're never on course. You're just circling in the thing you're trying to get out of. It's the gauge of lies. Bottom middle is called the heading indicator. Some of you might call it, you know, in your car. It's the same thing as like a GPS. It helps you make sure that you're on course or off course. And it's the spiritual gauge for that is purpose. Are you currently still on the line that God has for your life of what he wants you to do with your life? Because God has a purpose for every single one of us. And if we get off course in the purpose he has for us, we will wander around in the fog longer than he wants us to. But if we stay on the line of his purpose, we'll continue toward the things he wants us to do. And before you know it, we're gonna come out the other side of the fog. So we have to gauge whether or not we're still on purpose. The top left is the speed indicator or you know, in our cars, it would be the speedometer. Are you going faster or slower? Are you moving or you're stopped? The spiritual gauge here would be uh, the pace of your life. The pace of your life. How you know when you're in the fog, let's think about when you're in the car, when you're in the fog driving in your car, you don't speed up, you slow down. And I'm all for biblical principles and standards of, of practices that we do in our life. I get up every morning, I read the word of God, I pray, I worship every day. This is part of what I do. And I've got my whole set, here's my reading plan and I might do three chapters today or two chapters tomorrow. But sometimes when you're in the fog, you just need to slow down. Because three chapters may not be what I need today. It might be this one verse that God anchors my heart to. And I just need to slow down and let the Holy Spirit speak to me through that verse. I just need, I don't need to speed up or I'm gonna crash. I need to slow down, gauges. Top right is the altitude gauge. Top middle on the screen behind me is the attitude indicator. And it basically demonstrates whether you're going up or down, up or down. And the spiritual gauge here is your emotions your emotions. Are your emotions going up or are they going down? And these gauges work in sync to alert you that there's a problem. They work in sync. If one of them is off, another one will be off and you'll be able to see there's an issue in your life. And that last gauge is the one I want to talk about today. And more specifically, I want to talk about emotions and the impact that worship has on our emotions, the impact that it can have to lift us up in the middle of situations. Because how many of you found that in the fog, our emotions and our feelings can be all over the place? Right? I know they can be. They can be. You've got a witness. And so we know these things are happening all the time. And so let me tell you this, you've probably heard this before, but feelings are not a factual gauge. Feelings are not a factual gauge. How do I know that? Have you ever said, I feel fat? <clears throat> fat's not a feeling. You just dried your pants too long and they're tight, okay? They shrunk a little. That's what I tell my wife. That's, yeah, my pants shrunk again. Gotta buy some new ones. These are overshrunk, right? It's not, it's not a fact, it's a feeling. Uh, an example of this would be uh, talking to the pilot. He said, if you're on a plane and you're the pilot, when you bank the plane one direction, he said, if it goes that way for more than 30 seconds, it's turning. He says, in that 30 seconds, the fluid in your ears that starts at an angle when you bank will level back out, even though the plane is still banking. And he said, when you bring the plane back to a level plane, your mind, because of the fluid in your ears, will believe that you're still turning. And he goes, your feelings are telling you to turn the wheel and straighten it out. But he said, your feelings are wrong. And if you turn it, you're gonna crash. And here's my point. In the fog, we cannot trust our feelings as a guide. We can't trust our emotions as a guide. In fact, you were never created to live by sight or feeling, right? Second Corinthians 5, 7, you can read it with me on the screen. It says, for we live by faith and not by what? Sight. I'm thankful for sight, but he says, that's not how you live spiritually. 
That's not how it works. Emotions are a good gauge, but they are not a good guide. They're a good gauge, but not a good guide. And so, <clears throat> forgive me, I've had a head cold this week. Since you saw me last, I got sick. So forgive me if I cough or get out of, out of wind here, sorry. So let me ask this question to you. How's your altitude? How's your altitude? How's your emotions? Are you trending positive or are you trending negative? Are you trending up or down? Do you feel faithful, full of faith, or faithless with little faith to live on? Do you feel like your emotions are reflected by the words of discouragement or doubt or fear or depression? Where's the gauge? You may say, why does it matter? It matters because your answer indicates whether or not a spiritual and emotional crash is imminent or not. Because if you don't make an adjustment, you're gonna crash out. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. My emotions have crashed so many times I can't count. But how many times do we have to crash the emotional, spiritual airplane before we realize God's given us ways to fly it and guide it and to live our lives in a healthy way? And it's things that we have to learn and train ourselves. So you have to navigate the fog. You're gonna need an engage for your emotions. So that brings us to David in Psalm 63. We're gonna lean into a song of David in Psalm 63. Now you may remember David. Oftentimes when we mention David from the Bible, everybody says the phrase, the man after God's own heart. And if you have read the entire story of David, you might question that. Because David did some things that weren't, didn't seem all that godly. In fact, he seemed a lot more like us. Right? He did some things that weren't godly. How many remember the story of Bathsheba? Adultery. He was a bloodthirsty guy. He lost his anger quite a bit, but he was also repentant. He was a guy that was quick to repent. He was also a learner. How many of you know you don't have to make the same mistake 87 times? You can learn. And David was a learner. And what I love most about David is that David was a passionate worshiper. He was a passionate worshiper. It was a part of his life in a way that we see through scripture just time and time again. And so at the beginning of Psalm 63, sometimes the, 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 those that put together assembled the Bible for us, they give us a little sentence that gives us an explanation of where he is or what someone's doing in this setting. And the explanation says that uh, David was on the run. He's on the run, that he is in the Judean wilderness. And by default, we can understand that if you're on the run being chased by somebody, how many of you know you're in the fog no matter where you are? And so he's in the fog. He's in the middle of a situation that doesn't make sense to him. And so let's learn from the master. This guy's the best worshiper I know. Let's learn from him as he checks the emotional gauge. Verse one of Psalm 63, he starts out by saying this. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there's no water. I want you to notice some of the wording he's saying here. Uh, he's describing his fog to God. Do you see that? He's like, God, uh, I'm searching for you. Where are you? I'm trying to hear you. Where did you go? Uh, my whole body longs for you. God, every part of me just wants to be near to you. Where did you go? What's going on? He says, this place is parched. I'm weary. I'm tired. He leans into the conditions. He tells him what's going on. Verse two, I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and your glory. And something begins to trigger. I don't know if you noticed that transition verse right there, but he goes from, God, let me tell you what stinks about my life and what I don't like about what's going on in my life right now. And he transitions to, I've seen you in your sanctuary. I've gazed upon your power and your glory. The first lesson that we learn from David's worship that I hope we can learn as well today is this, worship reminds you that God is good. It reminds you that he's good. David's just honest. How many of you know when you're going through the toughest times of your life, you can be honest with God? He's not upset by your honesty. He's not. He wants you to come to him and be honest. And David said, I'm searching for you. My soul is thirsty. My whole body longs for you. I am dried up. The conditions are bad, God. My gauge is reading bad. I need you more than anything. But look at how he says it. He just says, but I remember your greatness. I've experienced your power. I can't deny it. It doesn't matter what I'm going through right now. You're still good. I know it. I remember the beauty of your glory and how good you are. In fact, if you follow David's story through the Psalms, David could not stop singing the praises of God's goodness 
Over and over again, he does it. Psalms 13, six, he says, I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. Psalm 16, two, he says, every good thing I have comes from you. In Psalms 34, eight, he's so excited. Have you ever eaten somewhere and you're like, man, this is so good, you've gotta taste it. You've gotta try it. You've gotta get in there and do it, right? Have you ever done that? This is what he says in Psalms 34, eight. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good just the way that I have. He literally could not stop worshiping God because as he did it, it reset his mind to remember the goodness of God regardless of the conditions he was in. He checked the gauge He said, are my emotions up or are my emotions down? Am I trending positive? Am I trending negative? Where are my emotions headed? I need to check the gauge. And when he checked the gauge, it caused him to see that God is still good. It directed him back to the right direction. And here's what happens. When you remember that God is good in the fog, then the next step happens. Your worship will return your heart back to God. Your worship will return your heart back to God. What do I mean by that? Let's look at Psalm 63, verse three again. David says, your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. Notice he's returning his heart back to God. He's refocusing back on God. He says, I will praise you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands to you in prayer. Something is changing. How many of you know when you're in the middle of something? If you've ever done this, when I pray and I'm really distressed, often I start with my complaints. Does anybody do that? Hey God, here's all the ways you're a bad God. Is that honest enough for you? And if I were God, this is how I would do it, right? And he just goes, aren't you smart? Thank you. And I keep going and then all of a sudden I feel my heart turning as I just let it go and give it to him because my father wraps his arms around me. And he says, it's okay, I'm right here. I'm right here. My heart returns to him. And I just love this. He lifted his hands as a visual surrender. He just says, he goes, I'm in the middle of it, but I'm just gonna, I can't even help it anymore. You're so good. My heart is turned back to you. You see, return means to give something back to the original owner. To return something means to give it back to the original owner. In the middle of the foggiest situations of our lives, sometimes we try to take control of the wheel of our life and we try to tell God how to do things and we grab hold of our heart and we try to make it do things that God never intended for it to do. But when we worship, we take our heart and we return it to the original owner. Worship causes our hearts to refocus back on a God who is good. It literally means to return your heart or soul to God. And this is a perfect place to drop in a little theological truth here. I mean, remember in the the earlier verses here, David said, my whole body longs for you. My whole body. What did he mean when he said my whole body? Did you know that you are three distinct parts? That your whole body is three distinct parts? Spirit, soul, and body. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul kind of wrapped it up and and this is implied all through scripture, but Paul said, now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and may your what? Your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. So the whole you, when we talk about the totality of who you are is your spirit, soul, and body. Now body, we understand, right? This is the part that you can see and feel. You can see your body, you can feel your body. If you stabbed yourself in the arm with a knife, you'd feel it, right? You see it and you feel it. And this is the flesh that the Bible says we should crucify every day. The Bible says we should not let our flesh, our bodies, our desires lead us. It needs to be taken under control and crucified. Then there's the soul. That's the part we can't see, but we can feel. We can feel it. If I insult you today, you'll feel it. Why? Your soul is that place where your mind, will, and emotions, your free will, your emotions are housed. They're right there. And so if I insult, you feel it in your soul today. And the Bible tells us this is the part that we are to check and sanctify daily. This is the part we're supposed to keep an eye on. Don't let it get sideways on you. Don't believe lies in your mind that are not of God. That's the soul. And the spirit is something we can't see or feel. You say, what's the point? The spirit is the place that runs on facts only. It's not about feelings. We're not supposed to worship God out of feelings. That's your flesh. That's your body. We actually worship from the spirit. It's our spirit that's born again at salvation. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says we're a new creation, a new life. That, that, and when he says that, it's saying we have a perfected spirit 
that part of us now is made right with God. You say, how do you know that? Well, when you, got, you gave your life to Jesus Christ, when you were born again, if you were overweight, when you gave your life to Jesus, were you still overweight right after that? <laughs> right, because that part has not been pure, perfected yet. If you were depressed or discouraged or going through a hard time, when you gave your life to Jesus, you were born again, did those things automatically go away? For most of us, they didn't. And that means that place is not perfected in us. You see, our spirit is perfected. Our soul is daily being sanctified. And our body, when we get to heaven, how many are excited about new bodies in heaven? Right? Parts that work, that don't ache and hurt. Right? It's a beautiful thing. And so why do these things matter? Why do we need to know this? Well, in John chapter 4, it tells us that all true worship begins in the spirit. And it permeates out into the soul and into the body. John 4, 23, starting about halfway through the verse, it says, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit and truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is, what is God? Spirit, capital S. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. When we worship God, we worship spirit to spirit. His spirit to our spirit. How is that possible? because he put his spirit in us. We've got the, the download of who he is in us and we have the number and we can connect with him face to face. And what we see in scripture is that as we worship him spirit to spirit, the truth that is housed in the spirit transfers to the soul and tells the soul to get in line and to do the right thing. Our hearts Many scholars believe, it's not fully and completely outlined in scripture, but the heart is talked about so much in the Bible. So many scholars talk about how the heart is kind of that conduit between the spirit and the soul. It's that place where God wants the truth to transfer into the soul to give us right thinking, to make us make right choices so that we can stay on track. That's why in Proverbs 4, 23 and so many other places where the Bible talks about the heart, it says things like guard your heart above all else because it determines the course of your life. Did you realize you can have a spiritual heart blockage? Oh, I get the, the physical one. It's the same thing. It blocks off the flow of the truth from the spirit to the soul and the anointing to your life. And so the fog we often experience is in this soul space where our free will, our mind and our emotions are. How many of you found that the fog that you deal with in your life is often an emotional fog? Or at least it lands there. There's an external situation and we deal with it in our emotions. And so we navigate that very carefully. And so when we worship, it transfers truth from our spirit to our soul and the fog begins to clear. We return our heart to God. And as we return our heart to God, his truth begins to flow through us into the soul of our being and resets our course. And so we return our hearts to God. And lastly, one thing we see here with David is it shows us that worship raises your hope in God. It raises your hope in God. This is, this is where the altitude comes in. We begin to rise again. Psalm 63, verse five, he says, you satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night because you're my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. This doesn't sound like a guy who's depressed anymore. This doesn't sound like a guy who's struggling emotionally anymore. This sounds like a guy who's figured out the more I look at you, the less I look at my situations. The more I look at you, the less these struggles impact me every day. They're still there. They haven't gone anywhere. But his emotional gauge got to the right place so that God could empower him to keep moving through the circumstances. I want you to consider what David said in Psalm 42 and 43. He actually said these exact words three times. So if someone said the exact same thing three times, it must be on purpose. He said this in verse five of Psalm 42. Catch this. Why my soul, he's speaking to his soul. Why my soul are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? First, he asked two questions. And then he declares two things to his soul. He says, look, I don't know what your problem is, but put your hope in God. 
Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. Have you ever seen anyone give a pep talk to their broken soul? Can I tell some of us today, you've been waiting too long to feel the desire to worship God. You need to start having a conversation with your soul and say, I don't know what you had planned today, but we're getting ready to do something whether you like it or not. We're gonna worship no matter what's happening. Worship doesn't remove the fog. It just helps us rise above it. It just helps us lift up. It brings our altitude higher so that we realize now I can see something. There's something out there. And this is what I found in all those flights, every time I've flown, when there's been bad weather, when we've taken off, this is a fact every single time. If I take off during the day, I don't care how cloudy, how foggy, how rainy, I don't care what the weather conditions are, within 10 minutes, we break through the cloud deck. And you know what's up there? The sun. No matter what struggle you're dealing with today, I want you to know the sun is always shining. Don't give up. Don't quit. Because there is something beautiful to our soul when we break through the cloud deck and the light of Jesus shines back on us and we go, I knew I wasn't alone. I knew you were still here. I knew I could trust you. I knew I shouldn't quit. I knew you were right there. You would never leave me because you promised you wouldn't. when what you see doesn't match what you believe. It's foggy faith. And my guess is every one of us has been in it one day or another and you've decided, you've thought about giving up. But I want you to know today, your faith is real. You can't change the fog. You can't even control it, but you can't control your response. And I think most of us wanna survive the struggles that we're dealing with because God gave us everything we need to survive it. We just have to train for it. We have to have a set of gauges that when what we see doesn't make sense, the gauges are the factual thing that we watch. And so when I see that, I, that something's off in my emotions, I've got to look to that gauge of worship and find out, am I going up or am I going down? Because when my emotions are low, the solution is worship every single time. Every time. Because it reminds me that God is good. It returns my heart to God. And every time I finish worshiping God in spirit and truth, I give him everything I've got. You know what? Hope is restored. It raises my hope. And so a few questions you can ask yourself this week or in a small group with your spouse or a friend, because you have to do something with this, is this. What, what is the honest condition of your emotions today? Are you trending up or trending down? Are you more positive or more negative? Can you just be honest? And then are you feeding your spirit or feeding your flesh? Are you doing what you feel like doing? Are you giving what scripture calls the sacrifice of praise? Or you say, I don't care how I feel, I'm gonna feed this part where I'm gonna worship God even though I don't feel like it. Because I can promise you this, whichever one you're feeding is the one that's gonna grow more. And the third question is, what are you willing to change about your worship so that you can rise above and hit a new level? I don't know about you. I'm tired of being a hobby Christian. I don't wanna be capped at 12,000 feet. God desired for us to soar as high as he wanted us to because if we can get a little bit higher, we can go further. I don't wanna stay where I am, I wanna go somewhere else. And so today we're gonna to practice this message. I asked the worship team to save two of their songs until the end so that we can worship. And I know someone in the room, probably more than a few someones who might say, but you don't get it, Pastor Mark, I'm not a worshiper. I don't sing. My voice is so bad when I sing, dogs howl and people run. It's bad. You need to know today that worship is the activity of every human soul. Everyone worships. It's not just something Christians do, it's what humans do. Some humans worship athletes and teams. Some humans worship money. 
Some humans worship relationships. Some parents worship their kids. Everybody worships. The question is, what will you worship? And sure, worship is more than just song. I'll confess that to anyone all day long. Every part of our lives is worship. The work you do is worship. The time you spend with God is worship. Reading is worship. Serving is worship. But yes, there's something about singing from the depths of our spirit that changes my view on the foggy situations that I'm in. And so if you say, I'm just not a worshiper. I don't think I'm a worshiper. Well, let me tell you, worship is what you do when you, when you determine that something is worthy or valuable to you. Worship is what we all do when we determine that something is worthy or valuable to us. And my question is simply this, is the God who saved you, who sent his son, who empowered you through his Holy Spirit, are they worthy enough for you? Are they valuable enough that you would say, body, you're getting in line today. Soul, you're getting in line today. Because from my spirit, I'm gonna worship God and praise him. I'd like to ask you to stand with me all across the room. Wake up your body. Do a little shake if you have to. I'm gonna ask you not to leave unless you just have to. Service isn't over yet. I'm gonna dismiss in just a minute. This is part of the service. In just a minute, I'm gonna ask you to worship from a different place. I'm gonna ask you to worship from a different place than where you worship from earlier in the service. Because maybe earlier in the service, your worship had no passion, no energy. It was just based on how you felt. You were processing through your week and you're like, this doesn't make sense and this is wrong and I gotta pay this bill when I get home. That, that's, you're, you're trying to worship from your mind or from your body and you just didn't feel like it. I'm asking you to worship from a different place today. I'm asking you to worship in this next few moments from your spirit that spirit that's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so let's just begin by bowing our heads, just taking a moment to pray together. Let's just get our hearts right for what he wants to do in this moment. Father, we just, we start with repentance. We start with repentance. If you're in the room and you've never asked Jesus to be your savior, your Lord, just in this moment, say, Jesus, I surrender. Forgive me of my sins. I'm yours. I choose to live my life for you. In Jesus' name. Everybody else in the room, you just maybe there's some things that have been going on in your life that you've not been bringing to the Lord. Maybe some things you need to repent of, some sins that no one else knows about. And you say, how do you know? Because we all are dealing with this stuff every day. Just begin to give it to God. God, we repent of the times we've been harsh with other people when people have been kind to us. God, we repent of the things that we're looking at, the things we're talking about. God, we repent of the things we're allowing to come into our lives. God, we repent that we've been feeding our flesh. We repent, we repent. We want to be set free by Jesus today. Would you say this with me? Jesus, I wanna be set free by you today. Jesus, I want to be set free by you today. Just say it out loud. Jesus, awaken my spirit. Awaken my spirit. Awaken my spirit to hear what you wanna say to me today through worship. And God, we declare over our souls, just agree with me today. God, you are good. Come on, in your own way. God, you're good. God, you're good. We're your children. We're your masterpiece. We're your ambassadors. God, we know today that we are chosen. We are strong. We are free and we are secure. We know, Jesus, we are born again through you. We are fearless and we are loved. God, we know that we're not alone. You're with us. You're for us. You're not against us. And God, we know we don't have to ask for your presence today. We don't have to ask for your presence. If we're here, you're here because you live in us. And so God, we just ask that you make us aware of your presence today. Let our spirit come alive to what you wanna do in this moment. Awaken our spirits. Let our eyes see your glory in this room today. Remind us how good you are, how awesome you are, and how worthy of praise you are. God, we lean in in this moment. We praise you and we focus on you. We give you our best as we worship you. Father, we give you our best.
We're standing on holy ground for the Lord is here and where he is his home.
Jesus, one more time. You're worthy. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. God, today we know that you're here because you say you're with us. You won't leave us, you won't forsake us. So God, as we worship, we're worshiping spirit to spirit. You're right here in this room. We don't have to beg for your presence. We don't have to plead for your presence. You've given it to us as a promise. All we have to do, Lord, is to check the gauge of our emotions and determine that we're not going to wait for our body and soul to make us feel like worshiping. We're not gonna wait for the, wor the feeling to worship. We're gonna worship because you're good, because you're loving, because you care about us, because of what we know about you. We worship from that place. And then God, feelings may come. You're not against feelings. Lord, feelings of, of your presence are beautiful, but God, we don't worship from feelings. We worship from the fact that you're good. And so God, my prayer is our spirits to be awakened today. Awaken dead spirits today in our hearts. The spirit of God in us, reawaken today. And God, let us sense your presence, hear your voice, listen to what you say and respond accordingly. And God, may your truth flow through our hearts, into our soul, into our bodies, and may the outward expressions of what we do demonstrate that our hearts and our minds and our souls and our spirit are right with you. God, I pray grace and blessing and favor over every person who's fighting through a struggle right now. The fog may seem so thick, they wanna give up and they wanna quit, but God, remind them you're with them. And all they have to do is praise you and worship you and celebrate your name. And you are right there with them and you can raise them above the fog that they're in today. Father, blessing and favor and grace over every person in this room. We pray until the next time we come together, let our lives be examples for the people that we're around and may they see Jesus in us. Thank you for this beautiful day together. Until our next time, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, God bless you, have a great week. Thanks for joining us online today. We're grateful to be encouraged and challenged by scripture as we all move from where we are to where God wants us to be. And if you're new to faith or if you made the decision to follow Jesus, we want to let you know how to take your next steps. Simply text NEW TO FAITH to 97000 and someone from our team will get in touch soon. At Faith Community, we also believe that God cares about the needs going on in our lives and that He listens when we pray. So no matter where you're joining from, we would love to pray for you. Email prayer at faithcommunity.co with your prayer request and we would be happy to pray for you. You can always learn more about the church at faithcommunity.co and stay connected on social media. Shoot us over a message on Facebook or Instagram if you have any questions. And hey, if you enjoyed this message, would you mind sharing it with a friend and giving it a thumbs up? You can also hit the red subscribe button as well as the bell icon so you're the first to know when new content is available. Thanks again for joining us online today. We'll see you next time.